Good morning, everybody. I am Abby Elizabeth, and this is the Earthen Vessels YouTube channel. This channel is for Christian women, but anyone is welcome to listen. And today I want to speak to those of you who are young in the faith about some things that happen when we are first Christians that can get us off the right way, out of the way. And of course, this is a serious message, but you know, it has hope in it as well. So let's begin with Mark chapter 4 and verse 14. Now, in this particular part of the Bible, in um, Mark chapter 4, and I do urge you, my sisters, to go back and read beginning in verse 1. And the reason why I'm not reading it to you is to encourage you to read it for yourselves. And verily, I say this a lot, and it's really important. If you're not reading the Word of God for yourselves, if you're relying on other people reading it to you, if you're relying on videos, if you're relying on other people's commentaries, what you're doing is you are watching someone else eat a really good meal and starving to death yourself. Now, am I saying not to listen to videos? Well, of course not. But I am encouraging you to spend some time every day in the Word of God for yourself and to begin your morning this way and to end your day like this. And this will go a long way to preventing a lot of the problems that those who are young in the faith encounter. You see, when we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, we did so because we heard the gospel and we were convicted. We realized that we were sinners and so we obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ because we wanted salvation. The thing is, though, that Jesus said, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed. And there are some of you who are saying, Sister Abby, you are like a broken record. And you know what? Yes, I am, because this is important. However, I have much more to say today, so please don't turn this video off if you want to be fed this um, video most likely will help you quite a bit. So in the parable of the sower and the seed, now Jesus Christ is going to interpret this parable for his disciples in verse 14. And may the Lord bless the reading of his word today. The sower soweth the word. And these are they by the wayside when the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Now this is something that has been happening with some of you who are young in the faith, and I'm not speaking this to, to bring you into condemnation. Verily, I'm speaking it to you so you can come out of condemnation. When we are Christian, it's not about uh, having things easy. It's not about um, being having the things that we had before. It's about following Jesus Christ. And there are things about this that are difficult. Now, the good thing is, is that when God gives us something difficult, he also gives us something that is able to sustain us and, and make us full of joy, even in difficulty. Now, there are those of you who have written to me, and there's a few of you, so this is not, this video is not directed at one, one individual. But there are those of you who have written to me saying, this is hard, or I'm feeling condemned, or I don't know what to do. And the, these kind of things happen to those who are not dwelling in the Word of God. And I can guarantee you that if you were dwelling in the Word of God and doing what it says, your heart would not be in this condition. I want to go now to, let's go to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. And let's read here in verse 15. And verse 15 and uh, verse 16. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. Now let's read in verse 17. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. When Satan comes to snatch the word out of a young Christian's heart, these are the methods that he uses. He uses the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now the world might manifest as things like um, education, career. It might manifest as family. There are many people who are young Christians who have been brought up in this false religious system where they've been told that being a Christian means having blessings, having abundance, having having a happy marriage, having, you know, a, um, prosperity. And the thing is, is that God will give you every single thing that you have need of. However, he is not going to give you the things of this world. Satan does that. When we become Christians, we have become Christians because we want to attain the heavenly kingdom. And in order to do so, that means that we have to renounce the things of this world. So the world, the flesh, what's the flesh? Well, the flesh can manifest in terms of things like in our flesh that are sinful. So, for example, perhaps we were addicted to cigarettes. Perhaps we have overeaten in the past. Maybe we have certain desires for various things in the world. That's all flesh. It's covetousness. It's the desire, the things of this world, the desire for things that please our flesh. And to go just a little bit deeper, things that please the flesh are things like malice, envy, anger, bitterness, wrath, and strife. Let's turn to Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, beginning with verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in times past, in time past, that they which do these things, do such things, pardon me, my sisters, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We've been brought, all of us, myself included, were brought up in a world where, that was very permissive. And Satan is permissive. Satan wants you to be spoiled and ruined with having everything that you want. That's part of the problem with the Western nations, is people are have too much. They have wealth, they have entertainment, they have anything they want to eat, anything they want to do, choices everywhere. But when we have these kinds of things presented to us, it creates in our heart conditions that are not pleasing unto God, things like envy, and murder. You see, murder is not just killing someone. It is killing someone. But it's also hating someone. That's what Jesus said. And when we become a Christian, we begin to follow Jesus Christ. And this means that we forgive those who harm us. And, you know, I know there's a lot of you who come to me and say, well, you just don't understand, Sister Abby, what happened to me. And you know what? Don't come to me with that, because I do understand. It is impossible to live in this evil world without having been wounded by sin and by sinners. And some of us were really badly wounded by sinners. But that's not an excuse to walk around in bitterness. That's not a, a reason to walk around in perpetual fear. Rather, when we become Christians, we have decided to renounce the things of the flesh. So we have decided that we're going to follow Jesus. And Jesus said that if we don't forgive 
people who harm us, neither will our Heavenly Father forgive us. So this is a commandment of Jesus Christ. So the works of the flesh are things that sometimes aren't as obvious as you think. For example, adultery. Now, adultery was the first one on this list. And of course, as a woman, we don't get a second husband while our husband is yet alive, even if he was really abusive. It's still adultery. It's still adultery. And whether or not we're happy about that doesn't change that fact at all. However, adultery is also Jesus said that a man who looks at a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. So adultery is also, my sisters, when we dress in such a way as to provoke men to lust. Now, as Christians, you might say, well, you know, I, if I do these things, I'm going to look different. People are going to laugh at me and they're going to ridicule ridicule me. And indeed they are. But let's read about this. Let's go to Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 24. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. So, for Christians, our Lord is Jesus Christ. So, we are not above our Lord. Let's read about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did in Hebrews chapter 5, beginning in verse 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him, that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Verse 9, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. You see, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was obedient to his Father unto death. And Christians are not above their master. And we are obedient unto Jesus Christ unto death. And there are going to be things in our flesh that don't feel good when we give them up. But if we do so, then he will be with us. He will guide us. He will strengthen us. And he will give us joy that the world will not understand. So we've talked about the world and the flesh, and now I want to talk about the devil. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3 and read verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, I'm going to stop here. This is doubt, and it's doubt about God's word. It's doubt about the promises of God. And this is how Satan comes along to many young Christians to snatch the word, the seed, that brings forth life in them out of their heart before they even get started. Satan will come along and say, well, yeah, you obeyed the gospel, but actually, uh, you're actually not one of his. Or you're, you've actually committed sins that can't be forgiven. And he'll trick you by using scripture against you, wielding scripture as a weapon against you, in order to deceive you into thinking that somehow you've done something or said something that now means that your salvation has been voided. Now the thing is, I'm going to tell you a little something. I'm a mother, and when my children first learned things, when they made mistakes, I didn't 
you know, throw them away. And when they willfully did things that they weren't supposed to do, I didn't throw them away then either. And I am yet, I'm a fleshly woman. If my maternal love can see that children make mistakes and do things they're not supposed to do, then surely God can see that too. Am I saying that we should continue in sin because of the grace of God? God forbid. Rather, what I'm telling you is, is that when you are young in the faith, it's going to be a narrow way and you're going to struggle with your flesh and you're going to sometimes make mistakes or even do things that you know better. But God, but God is more loving than that. He's more loving than what Satan is whispering in your ear. You see, Satan is cruel, and he has come as a thief to snatch the, the gospel of salvation and the hope in Jesus Christ out of your heart. Let's go to John chapter 10 and verse 10. John chapter 10 and verse 10. The thief cometh not, but to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come, this is Jesus Christ speaking here, I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. This is not talking about your bank account. It's talking about your eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. And Satan comes along and tries to dispute the promises of God. Now, I, I've said some things here now that, that probably a lot of you are recognizing. And I'm going to tell you about how we get out of this. How, how we get out of this kind of conundrum with the world, the flesh, and the devil, where things are happening in our early walk as a Christian that, that are making us to feel that we've failed. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse, let's begin here in um, verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of, of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Now we had just read in Hebrews that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, learned obedience by the things that he suffered and that we, we are not above our master. So we also learn obedience by the things that we suffer. So when we're a Christian and we sin, God is going to chastise us because he loves us. So that's one thing we want to understand. Let's read now in verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And this, of course, is referring to those who have obeyed the gospel by being baptized in the name of of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins and are, have received the Holy Ghost or are waiting for it. These are people who have obeyed the gospel. Let's read on in verse 18. Being then, and this is what I want to emphasize here, being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. When we become a Christian, it's time to choose. We have chosen to obey the gospel and now we need to choose every single day who it is that we're going to serve. Are we going to serve sin or are we going to serve righteousness? Let's read on. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness, 
and to iniquity unto iniquity. Even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, but now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, <clears throat> pardon me, the gift is a gift. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now let's read verse 1 in Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. How do we walk after the Spirit? Well, Jesus said, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. If we want to walk in the Spirit, we have to dwell in the Word of God. We need to recognize that the whole purpose of our salvation is so that we can be restored into a right relationship with God. And the way this was accomplished was by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the scripture says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ Jesus the Lord have put on Christ. And if you've been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, promises are unto you. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, some of you have not received the Holy Spirit yet, and the reason why is because you have been brought up in a world of theology. And every time that you think about receiving the Holy Spirit, you have thoughts like, why am I, I not receiving this? There must be something wrong with me. That's the enemy using your past against you, using theology against you. And what do we do in such cases? We cast these things away from us in Jesus' name. We say, excuse me, but no. But no, I am in Christ Jesus. And it's a promise that I shall receive the Holy Spirit. So get behind me, Satan. The answer is not to entertain these doubts and fears to the point of working oneself up into a spiritual frenzy of condemnation and fear. The answer is always the same thing. No matter what the problem is, if it's the world, if you're being tempted by things in the world, the answer is to seek the Lord in prayer and to read his word and obey it. And if you do so, you will be able, through the power of Jesus Christ, to overcome temptations that are in the world. The same goes for your flesh, and it also goes for the devil, who will whisper scripture into your ear to condemn you. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Master, the one that we are not above, was tempted by Satan in the wilderness with Scripture. Satan presented Jesus Christ with the idea that if he could just cast himself down from this high place, that he could do that because the Scripture said that the angels will protect you. Satan uses scripture all the time to confound young sheep. And the only way to overcome that is to do what Jesus Christ did, which is to answer with the word. And Jesus said in that circumstance, he said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Now, 
If you're not familiar with the scripture, there's one way to become so, and only one way to become so, and that is to read it, to hear it, to dwell in it, and not just to read it and hear it and dwell in it, but when you read something, then seek to become obedient to it. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And we learn obedience by doing the commandments contained in Scripture. I want to also say that these days we have, we have too many things in the, in the West. We have uh, too much food, too, mu too many options, too many choices too much education, too much pride, too, too much jewelry, you name it, we have too much of it. We also have too much information, and it's freely available at our fingertips every single day. We can just type something into a search engine and get an answer, multitudes of answers. And if that's where you're seeking your answers, my dear young sister, my dear young sisters, excuse me, then you will most likely hear the voice of the serpent. That is not the place to get your answers. You see, if you're wondering, for example, if you've committed the unpardonable sin, and you type into the search bar, uh, what is the unpardonable sin? You will get a plethora of theologians who are there to confound you, to confuse you, to condemn you. If you want to understand whether or not you have committed the unpardonable sin, the way to understand that is to open God's word and read it and obey it. Because the reason why Satan has introduced this lie into your mind is to get you to frantically search for an answer where the answer can't be found. When we are Christian, we follow Jesus Christ, and he is found in his word, which is the King James Version of the Holy Bible. And these days, many people have used the internet to hear all kinds of things, all kinds of things. So, you know, it might tell them, you know, that Donald Trump was prophesied to be president, or it might tell you that the Antichrist is this or that person, or, or the aliens are coming, or all kinds of cataclysms and things to fear, and you need to be a prepper, and you, you need to get a gun, and you need to, you know, that, that that's the enemy's platform. Once you've come to the knowledge of the gospel, and it may have been through the internet, that then what we do is we dwell in God's word and we turn off all of the enemy's nonsense. This is theology. So when Satan says in our ear, hath God said, so hath God said that you're promised the Holy Spirit? Hath God said that, that you can have eternal life with Jesus Christ if you follow him? If all kinds of doubts and fears are being introduced into your mind, Turn off the internet. Turn off the internet and open your Bible. I do that. I do that. I turn off the internet and open my Bible. This is something every Christian must do. We want to allow the Word of God to wash us. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'm going to close shortly now. Um, Let's read in Ephesians chapter 5, and let's read here um, verse 26, that he, Jesus Christ, might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. There is one way to get to the kingdom of God, and it's narrow. It means that we must renounce the things of this world. It means that sometimes we're going to suffer. Let's read in Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. 
So the way that we have faith is to continue in God's word, to continue to seek him, to continue to do our best to be obedient to his word. And God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. The enemy is trying to trick you into thinking that you can't do this, but anyone can do it. I remain here for you. Feel free to email me or to comment in the comment section below. And may the word of God go forth today and edify many. In Jesus' name, amen.